Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net where I teach beginners the skills they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. In this lesson we're going to talk about the important moments in the life cycle of your app. Now hopefully this will give you some insight as to what's going on inside of your app even when it's no longer running on the device. So in a nutshell, your app is either running or it's not running or terminated or it is suspended. So what's the difference between terminated and suspended? Well when a user switches to another program chances are your app will be suspended for a little while until the user switches back to your app. Now during this time the app is in hibernation I guess you could say. In other words the code in your app is not running but the state of your application's objects and variables, including the frame and the frame's backstack, are kept in memory. This allows the user to switch between apps quickly and fluidly, and there's nothing lost there. However, it is possible that the phone's operating system will choose to terminate your app which means that at some point it's removed from memory along with your application's objects and variables. This means that the next time that the user launches your app, it'll have no recollection of the state of that app the last time it was run. Uh, this means that any work that the user was doing is lost unless you somehow saved it. All right? And it means that the frames last page is forgotten as well as the entire back stack of the frame and so on. Now you might be wondering why would the phone ever take a suspended app and then at some point terminate it. Well there's a couple of reasons why. Usually this happens because uh, the phone needs more RAM uh, and it's going to take out all the apps that haven't been used in a while and uh, eject them, uh, terminate them, and so it can free up some RAM resources. But it could also happen that if the phone runs out of battery, like mine is about to do here in a minute, uh, then it will terminate all apps. Uh, also, if the user chooses to reboot the phone with the power button, uh, that would be another reason why the phone's operating system may choose to terminate apps. The key is that as an app developer, your app is notified that it's about to be suspended. However, once it's suspended, it's never notified that it's about to be terminated or that it has been terminated. So fortunately, you can handle the suspending event to quickly save the state of your app before it's suspended. Uh, and then if it does happen to be terminated, you're safe. So most of this work is going to happen in the app class. You can see that I have a new project called Managing State, which we're going to modify in here in a few moments. But we've never really looked at this app.xaml.cs class, and we've only worked with the app.xaml um, portion um, partial class, the XAML side of the equation. But as you can see, app derives from application which is uh, windows.ui.xaml.application and it overrides some of the uh, methods that are implemented in that uh, in that class. And the app class uh, is uh, implemented in the app.xaml.cs. You override the methods of the app class that you want to handle inside of your app. The most important I think is this on launched uh, event which executes every time that your app is initially launched. It also, another important event is this on suspending event that it, it handles. You can see it wires it up here with the suspending event. It, it basically uh, wires it to the on suspending method uh, event handler that we cr that's created automatically here. And that gives you just this tiny window of opportunity to save the state of your app just in case it's terminated while being suspended. And, you know, at a higher level, if you take a look at all the code that is here by default and some of the code that gets added in, um, the app class provides a couple of valuable services 
uh, to the rest of your application. First of all, it's the entry point for the app. If you take a look at the package AppX Manifest, you can see that in the first application tab, there's this entry point. And so this will be the first thing that the operating system seeks to, uh, to initialize or run or create an instance of whenever your app is loaded into the phone's uh, memory. And then secondly, it helps you perform lifetime management. So when the user uses the physical buttons on the phone to switch away from your app or to go back to another app, or the operating system tells your app to go away for now, suspends it, or permanently terminates it, the app class implements methods that handle those events. Um, and also it manages app scoped resources, not the least of which is the frame object for navigation purposes. Now I'll talk about the frame in a little bit more in just a moment. We've already talked about it a little bit with regards to navigation. Um, and when I say app scoped resources, we're not just talking about things like the frame, but also uh, you can add your own properties, for example, to the app class in order to uh, to reference those properties or methods throughout the entire app. So you can think of it kind of as a global namespace. Uh, also recall from the lesson on styling your app that the app class uh, can be used to create an application resources section and any resources or styles that you define here will be available throughout all pages in your app. So when you think of the app class, think of this uh, app scoped resource, uh, something that's available to the entire app. The fourth thing that it allows you to do back here and that we're not really, we don't see an implementation of this, but you can implement uh, uh, a way to catch any unhandled exceptions that are thrown by the various pages in your app. And so it's kind of like your last line of defense before it bubbles up to the operating system and your app just gets shut down. All right. So um, of all those responsibilities, I think probably the uh, one of the most important is navigation and so whenever the operating system launches your app it provides your app a window to display in, which is usually the entire uh, display service of the phone uh, so instead of allowing you to work directly with that window your app instead creates this frame object that represents the window but it adds navigation feature and you can see where that is created here um, and we discussed it this already in the lesson about navigation, but basically the frame object can load and unload uh, objects that derive from uh, windows.ui.xaml.controls.page. So in our main page.xaml.cs, you can see where main page cl partial class derives from this page class, which is uh, the fully qualified namespace is windows.ui.xaml.controls.page. So the frame knows how to load and unload pages out of the window essentially for uh, for viewing by the end user. And then it also keeps a, a history of all the pages that were loaded in and out of the frame uh, in the back stack, which is just an I list of, of page stack entries, uh, which just are essentially the, uh, the, the page type uh, in this case, it would be main page is the name of the class, uh, plus any parameters that may have been passed to it. So much of, much of the setup work for all of that happens here in this app.xaml.cs, where there's a lot of um, playing around with the root and or the root frame rather, and uh, making the root frame available. I think as a public property here somewhere. Um, uh, it also turns on and off. Uh, transitions like animations uh, for uh, loading and unloading purposes uh, depending on how your app was launched and so on. I don't want to get into all that. It's not really all that important but uh, honestly uh, what you're going to need to do is uh, make sure that so beyond managing the frame and navigation the app class is responsible for uh, the app's life cycle and specifically those scenarios where the app is about to be suspended and so what you'll want to do is save the state of your application not just the frame and its back stack and all of the information that it contains but then also any application data that's not yet been permanently persisted to uh, 
to the phone storage. And so there's many different ways to save your data while your app is running prior to it going into the suspended state. But I'm going to demonstrate three easy ways to do this. And so the first technique is to employ something called the suspension manager. The second technique is to use the windows.storage.applicationdata.current.local settings. So local settings. And then the third is to use navigation helper. Now, fair warning. The suspension manager, the first one I mentioned, and the navigation helper, the third one that I mentioned, are not part of the phone's API. Instead, they are helper classes that are added to your project based on which project template you chose or which page template that you choose. So by default, the blank app template does not include these. However, I'm going to show you how to easily add those uh, into your project um, uh, and uh, it's, it's all pretty, pretty quick and painless. So what I want to do is show you the problem first. So I'm going to start by creating an app that, that disregards the saving off state before suspension just to show you what the problem really is. And then I will turn around and I'll show you the three techniques that I just mentioned to kind of solve this problem. So if you haven't already, make sure you create a new blank app template project called Managing State. And then what I want to do is add, so I'm going to right click, add a new item to the project, and I'm going to choose basic page. Now, I mentioned a moment ago during styling that, or navigation, I forget which one, that really the only difference between blank page and basic page is that you get this extra uh, styling. Honestly, that's not the only difference. You actually get so much more when you add um, a basic page. And that's kind of the premise of this whole exercise. So I'm going to call this page2.xaml and click add. And notice that we get this dialog that says this edition depends on files that are missing from your project. Without these files, you must resolve dependencies on the common namespace manually. Do you want to add the missing files automatically? Yes, we absolutely do. Because when we do that, you'll notice that a common folder has been added to our project. And inside of that common folder, there is there are two um, there are two uh, uh, classes that we're going to rely on. The first is the suspension manager, and the second is the navigation helper. Now, I don't want to go into a long explanation of the internals of either of these. I haven't really taken the time to investigate how they do what they do, but I am interested in what utility they provide us. So now what I want to do is that I've added page two, I'm going to actually delete the main page. So I'm going to right click this and say uh, delete and it'll be permanently deleted. I'm going to add a page one, a basic page called page one. And then I'm going to add another item called page three. These should all, again, be the basic pages, not the blank pages. All right. Then on each of these page definitions, what I want to do is, let's reconfigure this a little bit. What I want to do is go down to the, uh, to the grid here, the content root grid, and I'm going to paste in the following code on each of these pages. So starting with page number one, I'm going to paste in this code. And then additionally, what I want to do is change this text block up here, kind of in the, the title area. And instead of saying page title, I'll say page one on this page. I'm going to go to page two. I'll do the same operation. I'm going to paste in this stack panel code. Now let me let you take a look at it. I apologize here if you haven't had a moment to pause the video if you want to follow along and recreate the stack panel plus two buttons and a text box. All right. And then we'll call this page two. And then finally we'll go to page three. Again, pasting in our stack panel, changing the page to three like so. And now what I want to do is go into the page1.xaml.cs 
file and at the very bottom beneath this section called navigation helper registration which we'll talk about later I'm just gonna paste in the following code you can see that it creates uh, event handlers for the previous button click and the next button click these are the two buttons that we have added uh, to each of the pages page one page two and page three so I'm just implementing these two event handlers for the click button for each of those uh, as you can see here so the easiest way if you wanted to follow along with this would be to, to select uh, put your mouse cursor on previous button and then hit the F12 key on your keyboard then come back and put the mouse cursor on the next button click event handler and hit the F12 on the keyboard and then create these uh, these two uh, code snippets so if the frame can go back then go back on the previous button if the frame can go forward uh, then go forward otherwise navigate to page two we're gonna do the same thing here I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna go to page two.xaml I'm gonna paste this code in at the very bottom of this page but I'll change this from going to page two to page three this time. And then finally on page three.xaml, I'm going to scroll all the way down and we'll return back to page one. So it'll just loop from page one to page two to page three to page one, all right? Great. Okay, if we were to attempt to run the application now, we're gonna experience an error and that's because the main page was uh, directed by the app.xaml.cs file to be the opening page whenever the app uh, is running uh, uh, initially. And so you can see in this line of code here uh, that we're trying to navigate initially to main page, but it no longer exists. So we'll replace that with page one, since that is our new starting point. And now let's go ahead and run the app. All right, so I'm going to go to the next page and then to the next page. And then what I'm going to do when I get to page number three is go back to Visual Studio. I'm going to leave it running, but I'm going to this lifecycle events drop down and I'm going to select suspend and shut down. And then I'm going to immediately rerun the app. And first of all, notice that we're returned back to page one. If I were to go to the previous page, there's no previous page. So there's no, uh, so the, the frames back stack has been eliminated from memory. It has been completely shut down and removed and no application state, uh, no frame state has been, has been saved. All right. So how can we fix this problem? Well, first of all, we can remedy the frame and the frames um, backstack by employing the suspension manager. So in the app.xaml.cs, we're gonna have to add some code to first of all, uh, register the suspension managers uh, with, with the current frame that we wanna use. And then when we are suspending the app, we want to tell the suspension manager to go ahead and save off uh, the current frame and its various, you know, its its page, its back stack, and then whenever we're loading the app again, if the app has been uh, terminated previously, so if the previous execution state was terminated, then we'll need to um, load it, load that frame and its back stack back into memory, and at which point we should be able to. Uh, to continue on as if we never stopped using the app, even if the phone's rebooted or whatever the case might be. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. This is gonna require three lines of code. We just have to make sure we put them in the right places. So let me paste in, first of all, where we register the frame with the suspension manager. So um, we're gonna look for uh, the line of code here where we are looking for if root frame equals null, and then you get this create a frame to act as the navigation context, and then root frame equals new frame. Beneath that, I'm gonna use the following line of code. Managing state.common.suspension manager, which references 
this class right here. We're going to call its register frame method, giving it both the frame that we want to work with. There's a root frame that was just created to represent the window that the app is giving our uh, that uh, that the operating system is giving our app to work with, and then a name, app frame. Okay. Next of all, what we're going to want to do then is whenever we go into suspending, you can see there's this little to do notification: save application state and stop any background activity. So we're going to perform the first part of that: uh, saving the application state. And so we will call the uh, managing state dot common dot suspension manager dot save async alright so this again refers to this class and we're calling it save async method now for reasons that I don't want to discuss just yet whenever you see the await keyword in your code and you get this long red squiggly line across the entire line this means you have to add another code another keyword called async that should make that red squiggly line go away I devote an entire lesson to talking about await async and the task keywords so I don't want to talk about that now just when think whenever I see the red squiggly line uh, and I'm missing the word async but I have the word await that I'm using you can see the await operator can only be used with an async method consider making this method async so all we gotta do here just add the async keyword so now we've saved the state uh, of the uh, of the frame using the save async method the final thing that we're gonna need to do is whenever we relaunch the app we wanna check to see if the current uh, if the previous state was terminated and if so this is a good opportunity then to load back in uh, the work that we've done so once again I'm gonna copy and paste some code here we're calling await managing state common suspension manager again this references the suspension manager class and here I'm calling the restore async method which should uh, find the app frame the root frame and then restore that back so uh, from that point on we'll be working with the rehydrated uh, instance of our frame here again I see the await keyword that means I need to adorn this method signature with the, the um, async keyword like so alright and then the final thing that we need to do before we run the app is to shut down the emulator and why do we need to do this well we've already terminated the app once therefore the next time this code runs um, this line of code here that we just implemented is going to try to restore an async but the previous time we ran it we never saved async <laughs> okay so that's why we need to shut down and kind of reset the um, the emulator so that we're kind of starting afresh starting anew alright so I'm gonna to go to the next page go to the next page and then I'm gonna stop here on page 3 I'm going to go back to Visual Studio and the lifecycle events I'm gonna select suspend and shut down making sure that I have left the emulator running I'm going to rerun the app now this time notice that I'm on page three and when I select go to previous page I can go back to page two and go back to page one and I can traverse back and forth through the back stack of the frame object very very cool okay so that is the benefit of using the suspension manager and that takes care of, of the um, the navigation state I guess you could say the previous state what page was was open the last time the user used the app before it was terminated what uh, what was the, um, the the back stack what were can I navigate back through just like I did the previous time that I used the app and you can choose to implement this or not if you don't want that behavior you don't have to allow it if you always want the user to start back on page page one then don't implement any of this this is just if you want to make the user uh, give the user the impression that they can continue on where they left off and nothing is lost okay 
All right, so that takes care of frame state. How about application state? And by application state, I mean, um, you know, what if the user was typing in text into one of the, uh, the text boxes that we added, and then they switch to another app on their phone and they forget and memory pressure or the phone runs out of battery, the app terminates and now whatever they have written has been lost before we had a chance to save it permanently to disk like we'll demonstrate later. Well, there are two different techniques for this and I'll demonstrate the first one in the page one dot XAML dot CS. In fact, hold on, let me start with page one dot XAML and what we'll do is uh, implement the on change or uh, yeah changing text change that's the name of it <laughs> text change event and I'll go ahead and allow it to create a new event handler put my mouse cursor on the word value text box underscore text change and hit the F12 key on my keyboard to create the method stub and here what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste some code like so all right so we're creating a instance of local settings and that will return uh, back a application data container that we're calling local settings and once we have local settings it's implemented as a dictionary I can give it the dictionary a key and then set it to a value like so so in this case whatever the user typed every time the user changes text it's going to update this windows.storage.applicationdata.current.local settings so local settings is just, again, a simple dictionary that's saved to the app's assigned storage area. There's also a similar storage area for each app called uh, windows.storage.applicationdata.current.roamingsettings, which will save data into a folder that gets synchronized across all your devices. We're not going to demonstrate that. For now, I'm just going to stick with local settings. So it's just a little partitioned area uh, for your app that allows you to save these dictionary settings key value settings okay and so again every time the text changes we're going to update the values inside of local settings inside of the key called value we'll set it here and then what we'll do is uh, whenever the page is reloaded we're going to work with this load state navigation helper underscore load state method I'll explain what that is later um, but for now, uh, what we'll do is just paste in the following code, like so. Here again, we're working with the local settings uh, folder, the container, and we're going to check to see, does local settings have a key called value? And if it does, then we'll retrieve the value of, with the key of value. And set that to the value of our text property of our value text box. All right. So let's rerun the app. This time on page one, I'm going to type in something like Bob. And then what I'll do is go back to my lifecycle events and select suspend and shut down. Now, I've never. I've never clicked any button to save that word Bob permanently to storage or to send it to a web API. I've never really done anything meaningful with it, but that is the state of the app the last time I was running it. I decided to switch away and look something up. I got sidetracked. I forgot what I was doing in, in this app, and now it's been terminated. The next time I run the app, I still want to see where I was at when I left off. So we have been able to retrieve that value and put it back in the text box. Uh, awesome. All right, so that's one technique we can use, but there's a second technique uh, that employs the navigation helper. Now, we've already used the navigation helper just a moment ago, but its main job is really this scenario, and that is to help you maintain app, uh, application state for any data that you're currently working with. So, uh, as you can see back in page one.xaml.cs, we've already used one of its two. Um, uh, events here that have been implemented in page one.xaml.cs and I don't want to talk about how this is wired up to a given page and how it kind of um, hides the unnavigated to and unnavigated from events 
which are actually implemented down here in this navigation helper registration area that I'm going to ignore for now. But essentially, once our page is wired up to use the navigation helper, what we can do is work with this load state event args and the save state event args to um, save the current state of the current page whenever the app goes into suspension. So on page two, .xaml.cs. We won't even need to touch the page2.xaml. Just in the page2.xaml.cs, we're just going to work with the load state and the save state. So in the save state, what I'll do is the following. Here I'm going to take whatever the user typed into the value text box dot text property, and I'm going to save that into this save state event args e. It has the save state event args has a page state property, which is again implemented as a dictionary. We'll give that dictionary a new key called value and we'll set its value equal to our text box text property. So that's how we will save that data that the user was currently working on. Now to retrieve it, we're going to do something similar like we did before in the navigation helper load state method and that is to first of all make sure that the page state exists and that it contains a key called value and if it does then we're going to retrieve that value. It's saved as an object so we'll two string it and then set that to the text property of the value text box. So let's go ahead and rerun the app this time. And now we will go to the next page, and I'll just type in here um, Tabor, T A B O R, and I'll leave it there. I'll go back to Visual Studio in the Lifecycle Events and select Suspend and Shut Down. And now I'll rerun the app, and I should come back to page two and see Tabor in the text box, and I do, and it absolutely worked. Awesome. So the key here is to understand that your app has a life cycle and you have tools to prepare for the move from suspension, which happens often, to termination, which happens less often, but can be um, you know, terminal for your app if you don't take some steps to save the current state of the app the last time the user was working with it. Uh, such as the frames backstack, any uh, values that you had already added to uh, that the user had typed in or selected on your uh, given pages and so on. All right, so the application data. That's all I wanted to say in this lesson. Hopefully you learned a lot about the life cycle and how to manage state. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net where I teach beginners the skills they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. So my personal opinion, the WebView app template featuring the WebView control is probably the easiest way to create an app, app if you already have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So in this lesson, what I want to do is take a look at the basics, and in the next lesson, we're actually going to build an app based on something from the JavaScript and jQuery fundamental series that I created for Channel 9 that you may have also seen on Microsoft Virtual Academy. Uh, just to demonstrate what's possible and demonstrate the types of issues that you might face whenever you're trying to convert an existing JavaScript-based app that maybe you created for the web at large uh, to, and you're converting that to this WebView app template. Consequently, there are only two lessons in this series that do not primar primarily use XAML and the phone API for layout, navigation, and so on. So feel free to skip these lessons if you do not intend to utilize the web stack of technologies for building apps. All right, so what I want to do is start a new project, and this time we're going to choose the Web View App template, and I'm going to call this Web View Example. And immediately you should notice something a little bit different about the Solution Explorer. There's an HTML folder and inside of it there is an index.html and a CSS subfolder with a phone.css. Now also if you take a look, we'll come back to these files, but if you take a look at the main page.xaml, you'll see that it first of all hosts 
in this large white area here, a web view control, and then also below that, a command bar with both a forward button and a home uh, app bar button. And uh, if you take a look at the main page.xaml.cs, you can see that, first of all, at the very top, there's this private field called home URI that references the HTML folder and its index.html page here in the Solution Explorer. And then if you take a look at uh, the very first thing that happens on the on navigated to event, it l navigates that web view control to that URI that's defined here, all right? And pretty much the remainder of the code, the on navigated from the main page back pressed event, the browser navigation completed, and uh, well, the forward app bar button and the home app bar button, they are all attempting to manipulate the, I guess you could call it the page stack, or rather the history of the pages inside of the web view control. Pages that have been visited, what pages you should go back to, what pages you should go forward to, and so on. And we'll see how those work in just a moment near the end of this lesson. But in fact, if you take a look at the web view control, uh, you can see that even in these little examples here, it's almost exactly like the frame. There's a navigate method, there's a can go forward, Boolean property, and if that's true, then it calls the go forward method. Uh, the same thing true here with can go back and go back, just like we saw previously when we were working with the frame navigation. So very, very similar ideas. All right, so let's close all of this for now. We're not going to need it. I'm going to close the app.xaml.cs. And let's focus on this uh, index.html. Notice it's, it has the following definition. Notice that there's a link, just like you would link any other CSS page, uh, out uh, when you're building web pages for consumption on the uh, the World Wide Web, uh, we're referencing the phone.css file here, and then notice that we're using just plain old HTML5 with uh, this HTML5 doc type. Uh, we have div tags, and if we were to just run the application just by default, we can see first of all what those div tags do and then we can compare them to the CSS. So the main page.xaml loads, it loads up the web view control, and then immediately it navigates the index.html page. The index.html page has those two div tags, one for my application and one for the page title. And if we take a look at uh, how those are styled up in the phone.css, notice that um, the, uh, the body is typically 11 point uh, Segoe WP, which I'm guessing is Windows Phone, but I'm not really sure, with the letter spacing, the color. So that's the default font that's used in this div at the very top. But this div has an ID of page title, and so it's styled a little bit differently with a 41 point font and the Segoe WP semi-light, which gives it that thinner font face. Also, you can take a look at how the HTML and body are styled up with heights and widths and margins and paddings reset. And then at the very top, there are these two um, media directives uh, that help uh, orient uh, for orientation purposes uh, to determine the device width and height and things of that nature for portrait and for landscape. And you can make changes here if you wanted to, or you can override them. All right. And, and that is a, a, the final point that I want to make here before we leave this phone.css file. Uh, you're free to add to this file if you want to, and I'll actually do that in the next lesson. But if you're really creating a real app that you want to maintain for uh, you know, months or years, then I'd recommend that you add additional CSS files and link to them in the, uh, in the header, just like they've done here with this example, uh, so that if Microsoft ever does update this file or make any changes to it, then your changes will not have to be merged with those changes. All right, so always kind of keep that separate, any changes you want to add to a different file. And since it's cascading style sheets, you can even override these default settings here if you like uh, in a second link and so on. All right, so let's do this. What I want to do is right click the project and add a new HTML page. So I'll right click, select add new item, 
And I want to choose, if we scroll down here, an HTML page. And I'm going to call this just uh, page2.html. And notice that by default, it does not have all of those little nice bits like the link and the div tags that our default index.html ha page has. So what I'm going to do is just copy and paste that whole index.html into page 2. Control A to select all, Control B to paste. And then what I'll do is just pay, uh, change out the, the div with the ID of page title to page 2. And I'll go back here to page uh, the index.html and just change that page title div to page 1. All right. And while I'm thinking about it, just for the sake of completeness, I'll change out the application name to Web View Control Example and change it here as well. All right, back in the index.html page, what I want to do is add some HTML below these divs. And I'll just paste in some test HTML. It'll have a series of uh, the header tags like h1, h2, h3, a basic paragraph, and then paragraphs that have anchors. We can anchor to uh, page2.html just like we would with a normal HTML page. No special uh, URI syntax like we see here in the main page.xaml.cs where we have to create a new URI and then use this MS Apex web colon, whack, 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 HTML, you know, so on. We can just ignore all that and work with the good old HTML um, locations um, that we're familiar with if, you're, if you are in, indeed an HTML developer. So I can link to pages inside of my existing folder and I can link to uh, in complete other websites like Microsoft.com. Very cool. So now let's see this working. Let's run the app and you can see the default h1, h2, h3. Uh, let me actually make this larger. Uh, and then the normal paragraph. Uh, I can click uh, the hyperlink to go to a second page. But as you can see that I have a mistake here because I should have put this page2.html inside of the same folder as the index.html. So I'm just going to drag and drop it into place and then rerun the app in order to see the navigation working. All right, this time let's click that link to a second page and we come to page two. Very cool. Let me use the, uh, the back button on the face of the phone emulator to go back to page one. Let me go use the forward button here on the, uh, the command bar to go to return to page two, to go forward in the page stack, in the back stack, so to speak. All right, and then finally, I'm going to use the little ellipsis and then select the home uh, uh, app bar button in order to return to page one. And I guess the very final thing I'll do here is click the hyperlink to go to Microsoft.com. And if it's wired up correctly, we can see Microsoft's home page there. All right, very cool. All right, so those are the basics of working with the web view control and the web view project template. Note that you're not limited to just HTML and CSS, but you can also add JavaScript and jQuery. And I'm gonna demonstrate how to do that in the next lesson with a more full-fledged example that features this really, uh, really uh, underpowered uh, interactive mini game. All right, and I'm gonna steal code from what I did back in the JavaScript and jQuery series to demonstrate that. So we'll see you in that lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net where I teach beginners the skills they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. So in this lesson we're going to take what we learned previously and we're going to create an entire app, uh, a very slowly little game uh, using the, uh, the web view app template featuring the web view control and what we'll do is uh, we're going to kind of uh, base it on this app that I built for the JavaScript fundamental, Fundamentals for Absolute Beginner series 
Here we're talking about jQuery events, and there's a little game that I have where it's a little bob head, and you keep clicking on the cartoon bob head, and it gives you a score, and you can reset it. And um, what we'll do is uh, I've already given you the assets for this game in your uh, in your folder. Uh, the lesson14.zip file or perhaps all of the zip file, all the uh, the lesson code is compiled into one zip. I'm not sure how it's just distributed, but wherever you originally are downloading this file from uh, or watching it right now, you should be able to find the, uh, the source code and the assets for all of these series. And you'll want to make sure to open up the lesson14 folder. There should be an assets folder inside. And uh, in a in addition to all of the, the little army of bob heads here, which we'll use in just a minute, uh, there are some web files, the c9js underscore 16.html, the script 16.js, and the style 16.css. And if you load them into a web browser, uh, you'll see a little game called the Click a Bob Game, and you can just click on the bob head. And this was inspired by a uh, a Click a Cow game that made its way on Facebook, and the, the the, uh, the guy who built it just wanted to show how dumb some of those social games were and it became an instant hit and people just kept clicking the cow to get more click points and that was the only point of the game. And so uh, I'm just kind of invoking that. You can obviously reset your score here if you hover your mouse cursor over and so on. All right, but at any rate, let's go ahead and uh, base a new a new project on this and what we'll do is go to our Visual Studio file new project we're gonna make sure to select the web view app template and call this whack a bob we'll change the name of it and I just want to show you how easy it is to translate a app that you already have built in uh, HTML with CSS and JavaScript into a phone app using uh, the WebView control. Uh, like we saw, you could use HTML and CSS. We're gonna show you how you can use uh, jQuery and, um, and JavaScript as well in your apps. And so to begin with, we're gonna copy over the assets uh, from, our, uh, from our assets folder into Visual Studio. To start with, I'm gonna get rid of all the images that are created by default. For us, and I'm going to select all of the bob heads and drag and drop these into. Hopefully, I got it in the right spot there. I did not. I move it into the assets folder like so. Very nice. Uh, next up, what I want to do is I'm going to create a subfolder called. Um, Add a new subfolder called scripts and a folder called images. And then I'm going to take the bobtaber.jpg. I guess I didn't copy it over, did I? I thought I did. Here it is. The bobtaber.jpg, and I'm going to put that in the images folder because it's already uh, the, the HTML that we have in this folder. We right click and open with notepad. You can see that it references um, the, uh, the bot. We'll put it, we'll make it reference the, uh, the images folder. Um, and let's also copy over the uh, script 16.js file. So let's put that, I think it's, uh, move it into the scripts folder like so. And then um, we'll also drag the style16.css folder into our CSS subfolder of the HTML folder. Great. And now I'm going to take a look at this as well. And I'm going to copy these references to jQuery, to our script16.js, and to our style16.css files. So I'm going to control C to copy them and then go to the index.html file and underneath my link to the phone.css, I'm gonna add these in. So the first thing I wanna do is make sure I reference the correct folders here. Uh, so to make sure I'm referencing this one in the correct spot, we'll put this in scripts. 
uh, folder, script 16. And um, when you're building a, an app on the phone, you don't want to include any references to outside resources, like even though jQuery is best served up from a content delivery network, here we're gonna to wanna to copy jQuery down into our uh, local project and reference it from there. So I'm going to delete that, and if you go to uh, jQuery.com slash download, uh, I can just download the compressed version, uh, the production version of jQuery, the latest version that's available 2.1.0, and uh, I've already done this. I've got it on my desktop, but you can feel free to save it. it gives you a little warning here and a little bit of, uh, you know, hey, you can't be verified. Be careful about this. All right, that's fine. But I already have it on my desktop, so I'm going to drag it into my scripts folder. I think I'm going to drag it. Drag it into my scripts folder like so. And um, for ease of rename, for ease of working with it, I'm just going to rename this just jQuery.js. Get rid of all this other stuff here. Great. So then in my HTML, what I'll do is reference it as scripts slash jQuery.js. Nice. All right, now going back to my original uh, to my original work here, I'm going to uh, take all the HTML out, like so, and just copy it in and paste it under here, like so. Um, we'll call this. We'll actually grab this out and put this here, even though this is not the application name. Uh, I think it will be better suited in a smaller font and we'll just get rid of both of these and then call the the page title uh, whack uh, Bob, like so furthermore I'm gonna want to change all references to click and I'll make those uh, whacked so you whacked a Bob very good very nice okay See what else we need to do here. Oh yeah, the images. We gotta put that in the right folder. Images um, slash bobtaber.jpg. Very nice. Very nice. I think that's all we're gonna have to do. I don't think we're gonna have to make many changes to uh, what we had previously. We might actually change up some things here once we have a look at it, what it looks like currently uh, on our page. But for, for now, I'm going to leave this alone. Uh, I'm also going to leave alone the script16.js. Now, we've wired up some things in jQuery for hovering, which doesn't really apply. But I don't think it's going to hurt anything. So I think I can leave it here. Again, I just want to show how simple it is to, to translate uh, an app into a phone app, uh, a, a, a web-based app into a phone app. So I want to touch as little as possible here. So one thing I do want to do is actually use some of these cool icons for the phone and see them. We, we haven't done that yet. So let's go to the package AppX manifest. We'll go to the visual assets. And here I'll start at the top here uh, with the various assets that it needs and just select Let's see, inside of my assets folder, right? I'll need a 71 by 71 JPEG. And then I'll need a 150 by 150 JPEG, or PNG rather. And notice that I created my PNGs in such a way as uh, to eliminate uh, any background. So they have a transparent background. That's important to let the, the user's theme colors show through on the tiles. Uh, so we need a 350 by 150, got it. A 44 by 44, got it. A store logo of 50 by 50, got it. I'm gonna skip the badge logo since we're not going to be dealing with uh, lock screen images. That's the only reason I would need that. But finally, the splash screen, 480 by 800, there we go. All right, so now let's see what we get whenever we run our app. Hopefully we'll get something here. All right, so let's see if this works. It actually works, look at that. Getting scores, now let me click the start over button. Now, there's a couple of annoyances here I can already see. Like for example, when I 
when I touch the word start, notice how it selects everything. Furthermore, that start button, I, I don't want it, I, you know, on the original web page over here when I built the app, I wanted that way over there, but now I'd, I'd prefer to be, you know, closer, you know, kind of like a stack panel, lined up uh, in, a, in a vertical fashion. So I'll move that over. I don't like the selection, and also I happen to know that when I accidentally miss something and try to pull down, it pulls the whole screen down. So I can fix some of these problems uh, and tweak this, but for the most part, I'm pretty happy with it so far. Let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at the W for Wackabob. All right, I'm gonna change the title up here because I don't like how it's represented. It's just the project name, but I can make that look a little bit better. And uh, let me pin it to start and see what happens here. All right, so that's the middle size. Uh, here's the small size, and then here's the large size. But you see how these other icons have the name of the app uh, kind of in the lower right, uh, lower left-hand corner? So I wanna fix that too. So there's some things that I can fix here. But for the most part, look how easy it was to translate an app. Uh, all I did was just copy the files over. I didn't really worry a whole lot about uh, whether the JavaScript was going to work, the jQuery was going to work. It works. I wasn't very worried about the CSS. Now I can go in and, and tweak a few things. But for the most part, I'm pretty happy with, with how things turned out. Uh, and now it's just a matter of just making some small, small changes. So let's start with uh, the, since we're right here, Let's go to any one of these tile and image logos. Well, actually, I think we need to change it here in the application. The display name, I'm going to change that to WAC-lowercase-a-bob, like so. And then in the visual assets, select any of these on the left-hand side, square one, uh, 71 by 71, square. And, and just so that you can see the show name options, and we want to show the name whenever you're at that mid size tile or the larger size tile. So that's good. Let's save all that. We'll come back. We'll we'll test that in a minute. Uh, we want to move that start over button to uh, the left side. In fact, this whole thing just rubs me the wrong way. I'm going to use percentages there because we don't know the exact screen width. Uh, as far as the button is concerned, I'm going to make it larger so it's easier to click on. So I'll just double its size like so. Um, I'm going to float this to the left instead of to the right. I'll make the padding on the top double that and I'll add a margin because this is going to be lined up now right above the bob head as far as I, I, the way I'm thinking right now. So I want the margin on the bottom to be, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 pixels. That should do it, uh, which reminds me, yeah, I'm gonna need to go back to the index.html. I'm gonna take that start over button. I'm gonna move it uh, over the game. Uh, actually, I could probably should move it inside the game. Let me just do that. I think that'll work. We'll have to come back and take a look at that. So I think I fixed all those problems. Now, what else did I have? Oh, yeah. I didn't like the fact that whenever we tapped on the word start and start over on the button, that it uh, it selected the text. I didn't like that. And I didn't like when I accidentally moved my finger across the screen, it dragged the whole page down. So how can I fix that? I'm going to go to the uh, phone CSS. And typically, I don't like making changes to this. But uh, this is one, one time when it makes sense to do it. So uh, there are some MS-specific uh, selectors like MS Touch Action, uh, None. And what that will do is eliminate the dragging of the screen. And then if I do um, MS User Select, none that will eliminate the possibility that I can select text on the page I don't want to be doing any copying and pasting it doesn't make sense on this app I think that'll fix those two problems as well we made a lot of changes let's go ahead and run the app again and see how this works this time see it got rid of my pinned icon because as you can see I made some changes huh that's still not quite right I don't like that at all now yeah, we'll fix we'll fix it Let's see if we 
All right, so there's no more dragging issue when I'm trying to drag, and there's no more selection issue here when I'm trying to like select text. It won't let me select it, and it still seems to work. It's just that that start over button doesn't quite look right, and I meant for it to be like on the next line. All right, I see why I, I understand now what I did wrong. So let's get rid of that. Let's go back here, and this is why I needed it outside of the game div. So just minor, minor, minor tweaks here. Let me look at the CSS one more time because I thought that start over text would be larger. So let me see if there's something I can do about that. Oh yeah, I know what I need to do here. In the start over ID, uh, I'm gonna set the font size uh, to extra large. That should fix that problem. And everything else looks good. All right, let's try it again. There we go, that's more like what I had in mind. Click the start over, click the bob, you whack the bob, you whack the bob, you start over, awesome. Success, what a great feeling. All right, and um, you know, I have some leftovers here. I probably could remove all this, we don't need the command bar just came for free whenever we built the app and there's some other tweaks that I can make to this but that's really all I want to do for now now one last thing and Matthias wanted me to point this out uh, I'm not going to show how to do this but if you're going to do a lot of work with jQuery inside of Visual Studio you might prefer to uh, install uh, using uh, NuGet install the package jQuery VS doc and so this will give you um, uh, this will give you uh, IntelliSense for jQuery, which is very, very useful. Syntax highlighting, things of that nature. So uh, you'll be able to um, you know, use it like you're typing in IntelliSense with C Sharp. You get the same experience uh, with JavaScript and with all the jQuery um, methods and selectors and things of that nature. Okay, so uh, that's all that we have to talk about in this lesson. It worked. Got it working. Hopefully you did too. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net where I teach beginners the skills they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the Hub App Project Template uh, if you're familiar with the Windows Phone at all, you have seen the hub control, which is featured in the hub app project template, um, you know, repeatedly. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, popular paradigms for navigation inside of the Windows Phone. And actually, this hub app project template is so well put together, and it illustrates so many ideas uh, that are crucial to understanding how to build real apps on the phone API that we're going to spend pretty much the remainder of this entire series just picking apart the various pieces of the hub app template to understand uh, how those pieces all come together to build a real app, how to modify that template to get it to, uh, uh, to represent data and ideas that we want. We'll build apps based on it. We're going to extend it and so on and so this is no small feat and that's why we're going to spend so much time investigating the hub app project template from here on out so let's go ahead and get started by creating a new project and this time we're going to select the hub app project template and I'm going to give this the name hub app template and then click OK and the very first thing that we want to do is run the app in the emulator to see what its baseline functionality is Okay, so what we'll do is begin to navigate between the various panes or the various hub sections for the hub control. So you can see here we have the section one with a list of groups and I'll use the mouse cursor to act like my finger to swipe over to the next section or rather pane or hub section, okay, uh, which displays a series of items with images that represent the, those items and a title as well. And I'll navigate past that to section three where I see other items that are listed uh, in, a, um, in a vertical format. 
and then I'll swipe to section four where I see another listing of items, this time without any images next to them, just a title and a subtitle. And then I'll move on to section number five, which again displays items in a, in a different format. And then finally back to section number one where we see groups. So let's now drill down by tapping or clicking on one of the group titles here that are listed. And you can see within a given group there are a number of associated items uh, that are laid out here. And we can click a given item. Let's select item title two. And now we can see details about that given item. Now in this case, there's nothing to show. Uh, they didn't completely flesh out this example. Uh, there is actually other information that they could have displayed. Another display of the image, of the lorem ipsum description text, the title, the subtitle, things of that nature. They just didn't do that here. Uh, but we can add that in pretty easily. Let's use the back button twice to get back to the hub, uh, to the, uh, to the hub control. And now let's navigate from the hub control to an item. For example, I'll go to section number three and just click item title three. And you can see we're back to that, uh, that descriptive page for a specific item. So use the back button one more time. Now what I want to do is kind of pair up what we see here in the application with what we can see in the background in our solution explorer. What are the XAML pages that make up the given views that we're looking at here. So first of all, all of these sections inside of this main hub control are all contained in this hubpage.xaml. We'll come back to that and spend a lot of time there for the remainder of the series. When we select an individual group from this section one list, you can see that uh, it brings up this, this listing of the group and the associated items that is from the section page.xaml. Furthermore, when we get into uh, the, the detail for a given item, uh, that is uh, the definition for that's in the item page.xaml. All right, so that's how those are linked up. But I think more importantly, uh, at at least a high level, there's this association between groups and items. So in your mind, make sure you understand the hierarchy that, of data that we're working with. Groups, which will have data, and within a given, like for example, one of the properties of a group is its title, all right? And so within a given group, there are a collection of items, and items have properties. We can see here that it has a title, a subtitle, a description, an image, and who knows, maybe there's some other information that uh, describes an item as well. Now, groups and items, these are just dummy sample data that's provided to you to kind of get, get the creative juices flowing to see how everything's wired up together. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at how that actually works, again, from here on out. So let's stop the execution of the app. And now let's open up our hubpage.xaml. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just get the, rid of the designer for a moment and focus on the XAML itself. I'm going to start rolling up sections. Like I'm going to roll up this page.resources. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And then you can see that we have a grid. And inside the grid, there, a grid, there is a hub. I'm going to start rolling up the various hub sections, which represent the views uh, the little um, panels that we were scrolling our way through. And there are five hub sections inside of the hub control. Again, at the very top, there is this grid that has the name of layout root. Do you remember where you heard that from? We talked about that pretty early on, that many of the templates in previous versions of, of the phone's software development kit uh, had this notion of a layout route and its its purpose is just this is where you do your work this is where you lay out your controls as opposed to you know maybe the apps header and the page title that appear above it but at any rate the hub serves that purpose it will give you this this header property which allows you to enter the application's name uh, and so on. And then the, the individual hub sections also have headers. And that's what we saw section one, section two, when we ran the app. And let me just pull this back over so you can see this little section one here, that word comes from the header. The 
the hub itself, it has a header that's set to application name. Some of it can't be seen off to the right hand side. Uh, also, another interesting thing about the designer, when you put your mouse cursor in a given hub section, you can see how it changes the designer on the left hand side. All right. So if we wanted to make some changes to the layout of the various items for section number five, we would then put our mouse cursor there. We can see the visual representation in the designer and then go about editing the, uh, the templates. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, let me roll that back up. So again, at a high level, you have a hub control. Hub control has a number of child hub sections. And if you take a look at the source of the hub, it really breaks down into two main pieces. There is the data that we want displayed inside of each of the hub sections and then the layout of that data. So there's the data and the layout or the templates that represent how that data will be displayed to the end user, right? So let's take a look at one of those hub sections which gives us the layout for the data. And you can see there's a lot going on here. First of all, a hub section has a data template. So inside of this, this is the template for how the data will be displayed on that given hub section. And it uses a grid view to lay out all the individual items. Now specifically, you can see here that the items panel uses this items wrap grid. Uh, so the items panel template uses this items wrap grid. What does that mean? Uh, it basically will position each child element sequentially from top to bottom. And then when elements fall off the bottom, uh, it will then move to the next column and then start to represent things from, uh, from top to bottom, then left to right, so to speak. So when we, when we run the app again, and we're looking at hub section number two, I believe is where we were, notice that item one is displayed first, then item two below it, now item three can't fit, and so it will be moved to the next column. Then below it, item four. Item five can't be fit below it, so it's moved to a new column off to the right-hand side as well, like so, okay? And that is the handiwork of this items wrap grid. So this dictates how all the items will flow but not the layout for the individual item itself. What dictates the fact that, for example, we see this large image and then below it a title with uh, some padding between them and not a lot of padding. It's kind of deceptive because in this current layout, it looks like this title belongs to uh, this image uh, because there's no padding or margin in between the two. And we could refine that. This is just, again, a sample layout. Um, but what dictates then the layout for each individual item? Well, that's the job of, as we can see here, the item template property of the grid view. It's set to a static resource called standard 200 by 180 tile item template. So we've seen static resources before, right? Uh, to, to, uh, to define uh, the settings for a given property of a control. Uh, in this case, we're using a static resource as the item template for each individual item that our data will be displayed into. And where is this found? If we go back to the top of the page, page.resources, uh, if we open that up, you can see the very first item here has the key standard 280 by 180 tile item template. Awesome. So it's a data template specifically for one item. Each item will then be displayed in a grid. This grid will be have a width of 180 and it'll have two rows. In the first row, you'll see the image itself, which were just these dummy gray images, right? Different shades of gray, which are available here. You can see like this light gray, this medium gray, this, I think there's a dark gray here. Okay, so again, these are not images we'll want to ship with our final product, just placeholder images for our dummy data, all right? But at any rate, there's a border that wraps around this image. I'm not really sure what the border is there for. I guess if the image doesn't load correctly or if you want to kind of center the image and allow there to be a little border around the outside. I haven't really investigated that all that much, quite honestly. Uh, and then below that, but you, let me start off by saying that you can see 
that is set into grid.row0. So it's into this first row. And then there's a text block below it that's set into grid.row equals one. And so when we, again, run the app, think two rows per data item. Row one has the border with the image inside of it. In this case, the various shades of gray. And then in the second row, the actual text block. And now where's this data coming from? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. But that's how each individual item is laid out. Then each individual item is arranged, as we said earlier, from this items panel template. We used an items wrap grid to create that effect of item one, item two, item three, item four, item five, right? All right, if we go back up here to the data template, again, this is what lays out each individual item. We see that there is an image with a source property set to this binding expression. So we've seen different binding expressions before, uh, like static resource is the one that we've looked at up to this point. This is binding to a data property called image path, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, the text blocks text is bound to a different property of a given object of the item object the title property and there are quite a few other um, uh, properties here and for the most part I'm going to ignore many of these as we go throughout the series but let me address it right up front if I don't talk about a specific property generally you can figure out the context uh, by the context what that property is doing so for example typography dot capitals equals small caps what could that possibly mean well as i look at for example this item title one and i see that the text is set to the property title i'm going to guess that the dummy data that makes up all the items in this template uh, it will have one of the items will have the text item title colon one and notice that it uses a series of capitals for the typography. So the capital I, let me move off this, capital I, then lowercase capital T, E, M. So they're not using the lower case, but a smaller capital case. And I would assume that's what this property, uh, get back up here, where are we? This property typography dot capital small caps so a lot of this I can figure out based on what I see in the designer window or when I run the app there are other things that are less obvious and so is text scale factor enabled what in the world does that mean I'll be honest with you I looked it up a couple of days ago when I was originally compiling my notes for this and I've already forgotten that but it wouldn't be very difficult for me to copy this property paste it into uh, into uh, my favorite search engine and do a, a search for that property to see what it will really do for me. Or I can just kind of change it from false to true and see what change that makes. And it doesn't really make anything visually here. Maybe it has something to do with the scale factor for a, a smaller form factor phone or a larger tablet or maybe a whole desktop. All right, uh, again, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to set this back to its original value. <laughs> I'll look it up if I need to. But if I don't address something in this series, um, do your own detective work. This is important. This is how you learn how to manipulate the given templates and how to kind of fine tune things in order to get it to do what you want is when you encounter something you don't know what it does, stop right there, take five seconds, Control C, copy, open up a web browser, paste it in, hit search. It'll probably bring up an MSDN article, read that, see an example, it'll show you a picture, problem solved. All right, so that's just uh, what I would encourage you to do as we go throughout the series. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about navigation. We have seen how we were able to navigate by clicking on either either an individual group or an individual item to the respective pages, whether uh, the section page or the item page. So how does that work? 
Well, if you take a look at, for example, since we're here in hub section two, let's just stay here for a moment. There are a couple of properties that make this happen. Actually, they're all grouped together right here. First of all, selection mode equals none, is item click enabled equal true, and then the item click equal, equals item view underscore item click. All right, so setting the uh, selection mode to none means that we're not allowing the individual items to be selected as if they were in a list of items that we were selecting for inclusion in some operation. Instead, we want to allow the user to click a given item to perform a navigation operation. So setting the is item click enabled equal to true instructs the grid view how we want to trigger an event called item click, not a selection event called item selected. And we want it to be uh, to, for the item to be clicked because we want something to be triggered, something to be uh, uh, to happen after that tap event. And so there's a semantic difference between a selection and a tap. And that is what this property uh, allows us to differentiate between how we want the item in the list to react to a tap. Select or do we want it to actually register as a click, uh, as a one-time event that will trigger some, something to happen, all right? And so then, what do we want to be fired off when that event is raised, when the click event is raised? We want this item view underscore item click event to be raised uh, or to be handled with this particular uh, event handler, right? So I'm gonna right click it and select go to definition that'll bring us to the hubpage.xaml.cs in a preview tab. And so based on our, uh, our explanation of navigation up to this point, you know, we would have expected to see uh, this frame.navigate to be employed, and it is, great. Uh, but notice that we're passing in not only the name of the page or the type that we want to create a new instance of and set to the frame's current you know, object that it's, it's going to be displaying in its frame, but we're also passing in an item ID. Where does that item ID come from? What does it represent? Well, here we see the first mention of a class of data that represents data. So we will have a sample data item and it represents one item uh, in our list. So again, going back here, it's gonna represent one of these guys as opposed to one of these guys, not groups, items, all right? So we need to find the current item that was clicked on and that would be passed to us through the item click event args. And one of the things that we can do with the item event click of args is, args is to determine which item was clicked and then we'll cast that to an instance of our class called sample data item. We'll talk about sample data item in, in a little while, maybe not even in this lesson, but it essentially it is the, um, uh, the class that represents item. It'll have things like title, subtitle, uh, the location of the image, you know, in our assets folder and so on as properties. All right, so once we've determined which item was clicked on and we cast it to an instance of sample data item, now we can retrieve properties from that sample data item. It has a property called unique ID, which we will then use to say, okay, the user clicked on, now let's run it and talk through this one more time to make it obvious, painfully obvious. All right. User wants to look at item number four. Now, how do we ensure that the item that the user will tap on is the item that will be loaded up into this item page.xaml? Well, that's the mechanism that we're looking at right here, and that's how that happens, all right? So the next step is, is fairly simple. We're gonna navigate to the item page.xaml page, passing in the ID of the item that we want displayed on that page. So let's go ahead and open up the item page.xaml.cs. Now, based on our understanding of the navigation model and how we can retrieve the object that was passed from one page to the next, we might think we know what happens on the item page.xaml. We would expect to handle the on navigated to event method like we've uh, done before. However, if we were to look through this, at least at first glance, in the item page.xaml.cs file, you'll find no such method declared. Actually, if you were to pop open this little uh, section here, that this region that's been rolled up, we do in fact find unnavigated to, hidden, and tucked away in there. 
And the fact of the matter is that something kind of strange is going on here. There's a helper class that was created for the express purpose of this example for the Hub App project template to handle navigation. In fact, if we scroll back up near the top, you can see here that uh, we have a private read-only navigation helper. And then here in the, uh, the constructor for the page, you can see here that we have this new instance of navigation helper created, passing in an instance of this, so that would represent the item page. And then we begin to wire up some events that are defined by the navigation helper class, presumably, that we're going to handle. So we would expect to give the navigation handler a reference to us, to the item page, and then it will start calling methods that are defined inside of this class, like helper navigation load state, helper na uh, navigation helper rather save state, and so on. All right, so we're basically going to say whenever the navigation helper fires off this method, this event, we want to handle it with this event handler method that we've defined here. Furthermore, if we look at the very bottom here, we notify our instance of navigation helper every time we've been navigated to and navigated from. So we're including the navigation helper in every operation that has anything to do with navigation. We say, hey, we're navigated to, and then the navigation helper says, okay, I'll take it from here. Uh, okay, I've done some stuff. You need to execute uh, the load state method now. And at which point it loads, it, it, uh, it performs that. Or you need to perform the save state now. Okay. So where's this navigation helper defined in our project? Again, I want to emphasize that this is a helper class that was created by Microsoft for the express purpose of the Hub App project template. And that it's not part of the phone's API itself. And if we take a look at the common folder, you can see that there's this navigation helper.cs. And you can take a few moments to just read through all this explanation about what it does, uh, how to wire it up correctly. Like if, for example, on any given page, this is how you would, uh, you know, form your constructor. These are the methods you'll need to implement. Uh, and then here again, this is what you're going to need to do on the on navigated to and on navigated from. You need to keep this navigation helper in the loop as these navigation uh, related methods start to happen. Okay, And then the rest is implementation that I definitely don't want to talk about. In a nutshell, it basically handles state management for you and allows users to return to the exact page in your app where they left off in their previous session. Uh, I'd recommend that you not make any changes to this class. Uh, spend some time reading through what it does and how to wire it all up correctly. Obviously, this has been done for us already. All the, the constructor code, the load state, save state methods that have been um, uh, registered, and then the calls from unnavigated to and unnavigated from back into our instance of navigation helper in order to keep it in the loop uh, whenever navigation happens. Okay, so I want to stop right there for now. Uh, there are many other features of the Hub App Project Template that we're going to learn about in the following uh, lessons. Uh, in this lesson, I primarily focused on uh, the templating of the hub control and then the navigation technique that's employed here using the navigation helper. Uh, in the next lesson, we're going to learn about uh, the sample data and how the various templates bind to it for display. And we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net where I teach beginners the skills they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. So in this lesson, we're going to pick back up with the default hub app template prior to making any changes to it. So previously we learned about the hub control and its various hub sections. Uh, we learned how each panel of content in the hub control is arranged using a series of data templates. Data templates that not only control the flow of each item, but then the layout of each individual item as well. 
right? We'll get back into that in a little while, all right? So in this lesson, what we wanna do is look at where the actual data is coming from. Uh, in the next lesson then, we're gonna look at how we use the data model that we'll discuss in this lesson to bind the user interface to the underlying data. So first, let's, at a very high level, talk about the idea of binding. Uh, what is data binding? Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more detail in the next lesson, but at a very high level, uh, you have a collection of objects. Let's say, for example, you have a collection of cars, uh, like you see on screen here. List of car called cars equals a new list of car. Uh, so let's suppose that that car class is just really simple, just like the classes that we saw in the C Sharp Fundament Fundamentals for Absolute Beginners on Microsoft Virtual Academy and uh, Channel 9. So these are properties that you're mostly familiar with. ID, make, model, year. We may have an image path that would be a link to an image that's somewhere like in our assets folder, okay? Uh, and so we can then add instances of the car class to our cars collection by either hard coding them in our code, which makes no sense, what we would probably do is open up some sort of file that contains data. Uh, for example, a, a text file or maybe a database file. So suppose you read the data from a comma delimited file that had the ID, the make, the model, the year, and the image path, and just you know a listing of maybe a dozen, two dozen, a hundred various cars, and you create an instance of the car class for each of those rows of data inside that comma delimited file. Or perhaps uh, you were to use a different file format. Let's say the JSON file format, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's just a different way of representing that same data in a more JavaScript friendly sort of way. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But regardless of the format of the data and how it's saved on disk, what we ultimately want to do is create an instance of each of those cars, add them to the cars collection. And now that we have a collection of cars, we would have a complete, albeit a very simple, data model. All right, we would even maybe call this an object graph at that point. I will use those terms synonymously. Uh, so in other words, we have the classes and any code that would be required to open up that, that data file, read the contents of that data file, and create new instances of the car class for each row of data in that file. And once we have those instances of those objects, add them to the car, uh, to the car cars collection, we essentially have a data model. That's all it is, all right? So it's not just the objects themselves that have been fully in, uh, instantiated, but also any of the code that will re retrieve the data from some persistence format, uh, a file format from the cloud database uh, or whatever the case might be, all right? And then create those, that's all a data model. And so once you have that data model in place, essentially a collection of cars in memory, now you can bind that collection to some user interface control like a grid view, for example, or a list view control, for example, uh, so that you can display that data in some tabular format, some list style format, whatever the case might be. Uh, you could use that image path property uh, as the data source for a thumbnail image for each of the items uh, so for each of the cars, so the user can look at their phone or their Windows app and see uh, the image of the car next to the, its descriptive properties like its make, its model, its year, and so on. And then clicking on a given item in the grid view would allow you to see more information about that given car and maybe something like our item template, our items detail, items detail dot XAML, okay? Uh, and we'll talk more about that in the next lesson. So hopefully you understand what we're trying to accomplish here. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm really after. The Hub App Project Template supplies you with a generic data model, including sample data, uh, so classes that represent the data and then the actual data that will be used to create instances of those classes. Uh, and ideally, you can just modify what they already have and use it for whatever type of data, whatever purpose that you have in mind. 
in fact later on in this series we're going to do exactly that we're going to modify this hub app template to create a complete app that displays images and recipes for cupcakes and so you can see how flexible this this idea is when we do that all right so where is this data model of which we speak well we're going to drill down into the data model folder you can see there are two files there uh, first of all let's talk about the file called sample data source.cs and if we were to roll this up we would see that there are essentially three main classes here now we know in our mind from our previous look at uh, the hub app template as we ran it originally that there were groups a series of groups and each group had associated with it one or more items all right so that's what's at, at play here here is the sample data group class and here is the sample data item class inside the sample data group each group has a title it has a subtitle a description an image path and then a items property an items property which as you can see is a collection of individual sample data items wait Bob what is this observable collection just ignore that for a moment in your brain don't see the word observable collection just see list we'll come back to the notion of observable collections later so just a list of sample data items well let's take a look at the members of the sample data item class we have unique ID title subtitle description image path and then content now we haven't seen all of these in use uh, in the uh, in the uh, the hub app template project but we've seen you know title and subtitle we saw the image displayed we also saw how this unique ID property was used for the purposes of navigation so that when a user clicked on one item it took us to the item page .xaml for that specific item so we saw how in in the frame it was uh, the uh, the item page class was instantiated and then it was given a unique ID an item ID so that it could load up the proper item and the user would be looking at it. if they clicked on item 4 they would see item 4 on the page right okay so that represents the structure of the data and then there's a third class and we'll come back and look at this in more depth but first of all notice that besides the declaration of the properties and the constructor which simply just is an overloaded constructor allowing you to set all the properties at the moment of instantiation there's not a lot more to the sample data group the same is true for sample data item there are no other methods really besides the const the overloaded constructor all right then we have sample data source and at a high level this is going to do basically two things for us first of all it's going to be responsible for loading up the data from a data file and creating instances of sample data group and sample data item and associating them all together after it's done that then it's going to make public the collection of groups with the associated item and there's a couple of different ways that it, it does this whether through a public property groups whether through this method called get groups async or get an individual group async or get a specific item based on its item its unique id all right and then finally there's this get sample data async we'll talk about that more in depth we'll talk about how it actually retrieves that data from a file and then creates instances of of data group sample uh, sample data groups and sample data items okay talk about that in a minute all right so that explains what this first file in the data model folder does what about this second file well, let's open it up you can see here that uh, we have data in some strange format with uh, curly braces square braces a lot of colons here are some words we recognize like unique ID title subtitle image path uh, these seem to be somehow associated with the notion of a group all right and and so the unique ID group one title group title one so what we can see here first is that if we scroll down we have a number of different groups number of different groups and then kind of indented inside of there 
the items for a given group and we see a number of items created like item title one, item title two, item title three, and so on. And so what is this? It's, it's in a format called JSON if you're not already familiar with it. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And I created an entire lesson on JavaScript objects and uh, JavaScript object notation on the JavaScript fundamentals for Absolute Beginner series that you can find on Channel 9 and on Microsoft Virtual Academy. So I recommend that you watch it. I think it's like halfway through that series. Uh, something about JavaScript object literals or something like that. It, it talks about JSON in this particular file format. But it's not hard to figure out on your own. You can see a name of a collection. And inside of that collection, it's delineated with square brackets. Here are individual instances of things. Here we have an instance of a group class. And inside of its items property, so there's this property colon, the value of that property for this given instance. All right, so it's an easy way to see the name and the value for a given property. And here is another collection of, of instances, in this case, instances with unique ID, title, subtitle, image path, description, and content. These are sample data items, instances. All right, and again, uh, the property name and the value. So picking apart the JavaScript object notation is not difficult. Parsing through it, there will be classes as we'll take a look at in just a moment in the dot, well, in um, the, uh, the phone and Windows API that allow you to parse through this data. And so I realize at first glance that JSON can be a bit intimidating. However, the good news is that it's, it's becoming a pretty popular file format for data. And it has the added benefit of being easily utilized by JavaScript and some commercial and open source document databases as well. All right. So, you know, I would say I get asked the following questions often whenever talking about these data formats and why did Microsoft choose that file format for the for this template. Uh, so why do they choose this as opposed to say for example a common delimited file format. Well I don't have any special knowledge about this at all. I can only kind of deduce what I think was going on in their minds. Uh, I suspect there's two reasons for that. First of all JSON files can easily represent object graphs like you see here where you have collections of objects that own collections of objects and we can see that represented through indentation and through the various characters that either represent instances or collections of instances of objects okay uh, and so you can't really get that from a flat file structure like uh, comma delimited files uh, so and then the second reason I think that Microsoft chose this is because it's relatively to read and write JSON using the built-in classes that we're going to learn throughout the remainder of the series like I mentioned a moment ago and then the second question that I get asked with relation to this is well if I don't want to use JSON do I want to use some other file format so maybe a structured relational database instead of JSON can I do that absolutely now I haven't personally done this. I don't have any videos on this, so I can't really point you in the right direction from something I've done, but I know they're out there. Uh, I know some have tried to use SQL Server Compact or Local DB and had some, some success with it. Others have had success with a local file-based database called SQLite. Uh, and again, I haven't tried either of these techniques. I'm definitely not the expert or the, you know, the guy to go to for this kind of information. But I suspect it is possible. Just do some clever searches, and I'm sure you'll find some good tutorials on how to do that. Also, you could use some external service, such as those available on Microsoft Azure or Azure Mobile Services. Uh, we don't cover those in this series, but these are all good options depending on the requirements of your application and how much you're willing to spend and how much you're willing to learn. Okay. So one final thing that I want to address uh, conceptually or generically at a high level uh, again, thinking about this notion of what really is a data model. Uh, this is a term that deals with your application's architecture. Or in other words, how you separate and layer your application's code. So typically what you want to do when you're writing software, doesn't matter if it's a phone app or a full-blown enterprise software, develop, uh, software project, okay? Uh, you want to keep logical layers separated. And in most applications, this means that you keep the persistence code, the code that deals with the data and where it's stored and how to retrieve it, separate 
from the business rules or the business logic that you're going to write to operate on that data any calculations any checks any comparisons those are called business logic even if it's a game it's still called business logic okay and you want to keep all that separated from the layer that you would typically see above that which is the presentation layer it's how that data is then displayed on screen to the end user all right so the benefit of abstracting these different responsibilities of your application code is that it allows you to manage the change that comes in your application more effectively it allows you to uh, to actually either change out entire layers or fix issues inside of a layer without it really affecting the other layers above it and that's as far as I'm gonna go I'm gonna resist the urge to talk about uh, application architecture in more detail here because I talk about it a lot on my own website be sure you check it out on my website learnvisualstudio.net so um, the data model is basically just a layer that encapsulates all the logic that's required to retrieve data from an underlying data source such as in this case a JSON file it could be a database uh, and then it, it's tasked with taking that data and then creating instances of classes that represent the that data in the computer's memory so in our case the result of calling into the data model is an object graph that contains all the data that we need to use and display within our application so as I said earlier the data model or more specifically this sample data source dot CS uh, has several classes that are all collected into one file the sample data item is the child the sample data group is the parent and for the most part as we said these are just data structures there's no real methods outside of the constructor just a set of properties and all the real heavy lifting here is done in this sample data source method uh, now we can take a look at this line by line uh, what I really want to do is we'll focus on the final method but let's talk about all the code leading up to that uh, first of all you can see that there's this line of code that looks a little odd private static sample data source underscore sample data source equals new sample data source and this is just implementing a pattern in software development called singleton it basically forces just one instance of a class to ever be created never more so you can only create one and uh, instance of this class if they ever ask for a new instance it's just going to deliver back to it the same instance that's already been created and that just prevents you from having to go through and constantly being reading from that file for every other page uh, that you navigate to in the app and everything can bind to it and know that it has the most recent updated version of the data by uh, implementing the singleton pattern uh, next up is this private and public uh, property that so the private field groups and the public property groups read only so you can only it that means only the sample data source can modify this collection of groups and this is just again an observable collection of sample data group just think for today or this moment a list of groups uh, and then below that we have three methods that are simply retrieving us either all groups a specific group or a specific item given the unique ID for each all right if you take a look at the implementation for these um, they they all call this get sample data async get sample data async get sample data async and we'll talk about how it does its magic in just a moment but what comes out of that is a populated list of groups in our groups property that we just talked about a moment ago the collection of groups that's been loaded up from the JSON file into memory and now we can work with it and how do we get all the groups well we just access that property but what if we want to get just one single group well then we perform this link query you know to get a single group or this link query to get a single item no matter which group it's contained inside of all right and we just return the first all right so that's the purpose of those three methods now all the real heavy lifting is done by this last method this get sample data async uh, and you know in pseudocode I'll just talk through at a high level what it does and we'll get into the specifics of of how to work with uh, storage files 
uh, using the API and so forth later on. But at a high level, first of all, we want to make sure that there's no data already in groups. If, if we already have data in groups, then don't load it again. Just exit out of this method. Next up, we're going to open up the data file and then we're going to read the file's contents into, uh, into a string and then parse it into the JSON format so that uh, the phone API can work with, with objects instead of just a raw string. All right, so now it knows it's working with JSON objects. It parses through it and knows that these are groups, these are instances of of items, but at this point it doesn't really have any notion of exactly uh, our data model. And so that's what happens next, where we turn those individual JSON objects into specifically sample data groups and then specifically sample data items. So we loop through each group in the JSON object structure and then we loop through each uh, uh, array of items in our JSON object structure and then finally add all the groups to the groups property here and then we we have the data loaded in memory ready to work with it ready to bind with it uh, and so that in a nutshell is how this sample data model works however i think it's important to emphasize that you don't have to follow this exact technique or this exact approach, even if your data is different. You can replace some of this or all of this. You can use a common delimited file if you really want to. Uh, it's just a template. It's not a requirement. It just gives you a simple implementation really uh, for you to pick apart and use the pieces you like and throw away the rest. Your application might require a, a, a less complex class hierarchy. Maybe you don't need groups and items. Uh, maybe you just need one layer, one collection of cars, for example. Or perhaps you need a much more complex object model. Uh, go ahead and implement that, uh, whatever you need for your application. Uh, you can even retrieve data from over the internet, like uh, we talked about a moment ago, using Microsoft Azure or Azure Mobile Services. But at the end of the day, you're going to want to make this your own. You're going to want to change this. Uh, and be specific to your application's problem domain. So as long as the result of your data model ends up being a collection that you can bind to from within XAML, you are in good shape. That's all you need to come out of your data model. All right. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the next two lessons. We'll see you there. Thank you.